Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Saratoga Podcast, episode 91. Wow, we're closing in on 100. Uh, I am here with my good friend, Adam Israel, good friend and co-host. Uh, Robin Dalton could not be here today. Um, Adam, uh, how, how, you know, uh, exciting times in Saratoga, great weather. How, how are things going for you? Yeah, they're, they're going great. It was a, you absolutely right, exciting time in Saratoga for the first time in the history of the track, hosted the Belmont. Uh, the third leg of the Triple Crown. There was no Triple Crown contender this year, but <clears throat> that did not damper the excitement. Dan, you were at the Belmont. You went and witnessed the race, didn't you? Um, I, I did. I got there uh, late in the day, but you know when it, when the races continue on till eight p.m., you can show up late and not not miss too much. Uh, so I did get there. Um, the crowd was uh, sh- you know as robust as you might expect, and uh, it wasn't quite apparent to me at first. Until uh, until I saw the lines of the both men's and ladies room, which like snaked, you know, seemed like hundreds and hundreds of feet. Yeah. Well, let's let's take well, let's let's take a step back and talk about the whole weekend. You know, it started off. The racing was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Four days of racing. Correct. Uh, correct. Yes. All right. And and the first the kickoff party was the Blues Traveler concert on Thursday night on Broadway. And, and- Wednesday night. Yes. What were your thoughts about that concert? Um, I, I thought it was great. There was a, a large, excited, happy, mostly sober when I was there anyway, well-behaved crowd. Uh, and you were clearly enjoying it. Blues Traveler was rocking it. Um, in all honesty, they haven't had a hit since the 90s, but but that's fine because they're a great band. And, you know, they don't have to be – they're, they're, they're a band that a lot of people know about. And they really rocked it. They seemed happy to be there. They had the energy. They had the excitement. Um Broadway was was phenomenal. However, and this is Broadway, the stretch going from uh, the city center back all the way to the intersection of, of church and lake. And it was filled sidewalk to sidewalk. Um, if they get a similar crowd next year or bigger, and chances are they may be going for that, that location won't work for a bigger crowd. It, it, it's a narrow, long location. So unless you want to be jammed in up front to get a good view, you have to go far back. Whereas a more traditional concert setting, even in a park or something, would more dovetail out and give people room to spread out. So that's a nice problem to have, right? Our our event was so successful, we need to find a, a bigger, more appropriate venue. Yeah, we need, to, we need to scale up. Yeah, that was what I thought when they announced they were going to uh, have it on Broadway. I thought, you know, Congress Park has this really underutilized central area that I they do the only thing, and I I grew up across the street from Congress Park. I grew up, you know, that was where I spent my childhood. I got married in that park, had my bar mitzvah in that that park. They, they have this beautiful kind of large grassy area in the center. And the only thing I've ever seen there is in the summer they'll do some of those small little concerts and Shakespeare in the park, but it's really underutilized. And I thought that would be a great spot for it because you're not on the hot. The, the, we were lucky the weather worked out. It wasn't rainy. It wasn't it wasn't overly hot, but people like to be on grass instead of the pavement. I thought that would be a great spot for it. Do you have any thoughts on where you'd like to see it next year? If you could wave a magic uh, wand. Yes, I do. I'm going to put this conversation on hold for a minute here, Adam, because um, uh, we originally invited Assembly uh, Assemblywoman Carrie Warner on, and she is backstage now. And uh, let me let me tee it up why we asked her to come on. The legislature earlier this week they ended their session. And they often get the you know ninety five percent of the legislation is passed in, in in the last day or sometimes the last few hours, and included in in their end of uh, session uh, uh, package of bills that were passed was a uh, the legislature both houses passed a bill to add uh, both registration and some regulation and taxation of short term rentals the you know airbnbs traditionally and then a few other companies as we know about and that as we know is an important issue here in Saratoga Springs uh, so as the state legislation will have a direct impact on Saratoga Springs Saratoga Springs will uh, likely implement their own registration and the state the state law that was just passed assuming the governor signs it and we'll talk to the assemblywoman about that um, um, uh, would would allow that as long as it is in place before 120 days after the signature of the bill. But let me talk to let's talk to somebody that knows way more about this than you and I, uh, and let's bring in uh, probably my favorite assembly person, uh, uh, Assemblywoman Carrie Warner. Assemblywoman, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Great to see you both. 
may haven't we haven't I haven't uh, bumped in you in a while. Uh, maybe this summer will be a lot more opportunities because you've been busy down in Albany, haven't you? I have, and I'm happy to say that I am back in Saratoga and in the 113th Assembly District, uh, and uh, happy to be not going down to Albany every day. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Imagine if you were from uh, my hometown of Buffalo or outer Long Island and having to travel that distance. Yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. So can you can you fill us in as to what you've accomplished in the legislature, specifically with the short term rental legislation, but also perhaps um, uh, at the end, uh, uh, you know, overall with with the overall package of bills, things you accomplished and things things you wish you accomplished, I guess. And as always the case, there's always sure. a couple sure. that don't get through. Right. Absolutely. So I'll start with the short term rental bill. And this is something that. Uh, the sponsor of the legislation, uh, Assemblymember Pat Fahey from Albany, had been working on for a long time. Uh, the Senate co-sponsor, Michelle Hinchy, Senator Hinchy uh, from the Mid-Hudson Valley, uh, likewise. And it's something that every county in, uh, in New York State has uh, made a priority uh, that this is legislation that they wanted to see passed. And it's actually a pretty simple bill. Uh, so it creates a registry of uh, short-term rentals, and a short-term rental is a, is a whole dwelling space. It might be a room in a house, um, anything that you rent for less than 30 days. So with respect to Saratoga Springs, if you have a history and you're in the business of, um, you've got, you rent your house out for the entire seven weeks of the, of the race season. So you have a tenant, you've been working with this person for years. Um, and I certainly, and I'm sure we all know people in, in Saratoga who are, who are in this situation. They move out of their house on the day before the race meet begins, their tenant moves in, their tenant is there through uh, Labor Day weekend, and then the family moves back into the house. That's more than 30 days, and that's not, that's not covered by this. Okay. So this is a, this is for a period less than 30 days. Um, and uh, it is, what it basically does is it says, there's, we're gonna create a registry. It'll be at the statewide level. Um, you'll have to re-register every two years. It'll be a very lightweight fee. Um, and, then the, um, uh, and then the platforms, Airbnb, VRBO, whatever the other platforms are, um, they will have to populate the registry with rental information. So how many nights is it rented? How many, you know, how many times during the year? Uh, those, that, those parameters. And they're going to have to, uh, the platforms will have to collect from the renter um, sales tax. And if there's an occupancy tax in that county or that municipality, they'll have to collect the occupancy tax as well. And then they'll have to remit it to the state on behalf of the of the, um, the, the landlord. And I think that's a real benefit because as you can imagine, if you get crosswise of the taxing authorities, so if you are supposed to remit, collect and remit tax and you don't, um, then you're on the hook for it. And that the, um, the penalties and the interest can accrue on a daily basis and they can be pretty substantial. So um, taking that burden off of the owner and putting it onto the platform means that the owners are going to not be, um, not have that liability or that, that concern. So it's a registry um, and then it is, the, it is up to the, um, it's up to the platforms to collect the tax from the, from the renter and remit it on, on their behalf. Uh, that's, that's what the, that's what it does. Um, so as, I'm going to pause, the, pause there and let you ask some questions. As, as the dwelling owner, never see that, that when whoever's renting a dwelling for a week during and that fee would be tacked on their pay. And the Adam, work. Adam, you're you're breaking up. I'm only hearing like every other syllable. Sorry. Um, is, is that anybody? Not really. All right. Well, Dan, why don't you take it? I messed with my phone. Okay. Um, <laughs> Summer woman, the. What you just described with the taxation, that's something, and I'll speak for Adam's case, his family's in the hotel industry, um, but uh, that's something the hoteliers have been you know, pointing out for years. Like our, our customers pay a, a sales tax and bed tax 
but the other one's going to freebie. That's an unfair advantage. I, I assume Absolutely. that was one of the things you were trying to address, correct? Uh, absolutely. This is about leveling the playing field. Um, so if you if you're a if you're a tourist and you're coming to Saratoga, if you're choosing to stay in a hotel or you're choosing to do a short term rental, you shouldn't the, the competition should not be based on where are you paying a tax and where aren't you paying a tax. It should be on what is the type of what's the type of um, uh, tourist housing that is most uh, most comfortable for you and for the family that you've got coming with you. So this is a this is about leveling the this helps level the playing field. Great, Does, and uh, Adam, how how are you? Yeah, let me know if you can hear me now. Does New York State have any any uh, projections on how much revenue they think they'll draw from this? Yeah, they do. So um, they think it's five hundred five. I want to say five hundred million, but that can't be right. Um, so it's about a billion dollar industry outside of New York City. So um, if you take a five billion dollar industry, if the combination of sales tax and occupancy tax is something like, you know, 10, 12 percent, it's it's whatever the 10, 12 percent times I, times a billion dollars. Big number. Okay. It's a big number. It's and, a big number. And, and when you think about the fact that the occupancy tax funds tourism programs. So um, in our case, it funds Discover Saratoga. And what does Discover Saratoga do? They promote the region to tourists uh, around the globe. That benefits the owners of the short-term rentals just as it benefits the owners of the hotels. And, and in some way, so I understand this correctly, uh, the way the bed tax and the sales tax works, the municipalities and the county will, will get their shares of the sales tax and the bed tax is what's on top of that. And that's what goes to the, uh, the, the tourism agencies. Is that correct? That's correct. And, okay. and I don't, I mean, I can't speak for every county, but my understanding is that generally speaking, the occupancy taxes go to fund tourism programs. Sure. Now, now I, I imagine municipalities like Saratoga can, they can't do anything less stringent than this, but they can, pack on regulations to these regulations, is that correct? Yes, so so it, it leaves open the possibility that, um, because there's there's some just some basic health and safety pieces in this. So you have to have a, you have to have a fire extinguisher, you have to have uh, posted the exits, you have to have posted uh, and where people can see it, a list of how do I reach the fire department? How do I reach the, the EMS, all of the emergency numbers. So all of that has to be posted. And that's really basically the only um, the only health and safety requirements that's embedded in this bill. So municipalities can can layer on additional health and safety regulations. Um, they can also, you know, some municipalities are trying to say, listen, we don't we want to use within our zoning, we don't want um, these short-term rentals everywhere. We want them to be limited maybe just to our downtown area or just to a certain area. Or maybe maybe we want to be even more stringent than that and say we're only going to allow a fixed number of licenses for short term rentals in a, in a given year. And so it, this leaves open the possibility that municipalities can can address whatever the whatever the concerns they have around um, around short-term rentals, they can they can layer on additional health and safety concerns and they can also modify their zoning to allow them in certain areas and not allow them in others. Can, can I Is there ask a question? In this about... bill... Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, th thanks, Adam. Uh, regarding Governor Hochul, I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Assemblywoman, she had uh, some overlap where she agreed with some of what this legislation did, but she also had some of her own ideas that were not consistent or at least not parallel to, to this legislation. If I'm wrong there, tell me, but do you have any idea what she will do with it when it uh, reaches her desk? You know, I can't speak for the governor. I do know that um, in when we were having these discussions um, in the course of the budget, because originally the hope was to was to make this part of the uh, this year's budget. Her concern was that that perhaps this would require um, a, a fairly heavyweight state workforce to support it. Uh, but the but the goal here is to have this be a it's a you know to set up a database 
and then have it be self-populating by the platforms, um, which doesn't mean that there's not going to be, you know, you're not going to need somebody to maintain the database. Certainly you will, uh, but the, but the, you know, the belief is that in today's technology world, you can take feeds from the, from the platforms, they can feed the database um, with the information that's required. So once you've set it up with a with a uh, an external interface for the hosts to register that they have a short term rental, then after that the platforms can themselves just feed it. And there's a you know there would be a reporting mechanism that the municipalities could draw down reports about um, what the you know the number of short term rentals are in their community. Um, they the the frequency with which they're rented, uh, they can the you know sort of intensity of use, and the state could similarly draw down statewide or regional reports as well. Great. And can you explain uh, um, how and when this could get to the governor? There's a long gap between now and the end of the year, right? When it could be sent to her? Right. Right. So the way the process of getting legislation signed works is that they, the House, which passes it first, which in this case would be the Senate, um, they are responsible for um, for getting it over to the governor. And typically the House will wait until the governor staff uh, calls it up for signature. And then once they call it up, they have 10 working days um, uh, with no 10 days, 10 calendar days um, with which to either sign it or veto it. Um, and so you know, obviously we're hoping that the governor will sign it um, or at worst case that she'll ask for some modifications to it and those will be and that will be a condition of her uh, signing it and then um, uh, and then we would pass those modifications early next year. Okay, Adam? Yeah, I, I was going to ask, is there any, any modifications that you, you would have liked to see in this bill that are not there that maybe Saratoga is about enacting or is it a complete bill? I think it's a pretty clean bill. There's one piece of it that I think needs some clarification. Um, so there's a there's a there's language in the bill that requires that the homeowner have um, uh, additional liability insurance um, if they are renting it out, and the and it's really a clarification because most of the platforms now carry a million dollar policy that the home that the the owner of the property has it covers the owner of the property. And so it's really about um, so that policy would be um, is would more than cover that requirement. So it's really only if you are not otherwise covered by a policy available through the platform, do you need to have this additional insurance? And um, and certainly I got in the run up to the to the vote. I had a lot of emails from people who expressed some concerns about this. Um, and one concern that I had heard uh, that I hadn't thought of was this this idea that additional homeowners insurance is kind of an expensive burden. And and many people are using these short term rentals as a way to supplement their base income. And it's you know, it's how they pay. It's how they pay their mortgage. It's how they pay their taxes. So um, adding an additional cost to them was was not a good thing. And and the uh, and what the and in the debate, the the sponsor made it clear that that requirement um, is is taken care of by the platforms, generally speaking. And it's only if you are if you happen to be renting through a platform that doesn't have um, that million dollar policy, do you have to have your own personal insurance? So um, I think I would just like to see that a little bit clarified because I don't want people to feel like um, this legislation is going to put them out of business because it's not um, that, you know, if you if you are a short term renter and um, and you're and you're supplementing your income. You're making money off of this, um, and it's a it it's a, this isn't going to this isn't going to require that you um, you get out of the business. And there should be no other than having to register. And as I said, it's a pretty lightweight fee, like or it will be a pretty lightweight fee. Um, so it should be not it's it's not intended to be a burden on anybody. Terrific. Um. Adam, do you have anything else? I have one follow-up. Uh... Oh, that's that's good. Good, good to hear. That we're we're regulating this industry. I think everybody agrees there should be some regulation. It's where on the spectrum that regulation falls. It's where you get some disagreement. But it's glad to hear that this uh, it's not over. It does not sound overly burdensome. Was my concern. 
Dan, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, I think most people think there should be some some regulation and some registration. Uh, so this was a good step by the legislature. Uh, uh, I believe you were a co-sponsor, Assemblywoman. Is that correct? I am. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, you know, now the cities will do their thing, which will involve uh, uh, a payment uh, that is not mild, I, I think, but that's fine because a lot of municipalities do that. Hopefully it's fair. We're still waiting for Commissioner Moran. He told the Daily Gazette earlier this week that uh, the legislation was written, but there were some uh, uh, side zoning issues that had to be clarified before he could bring it forward. So that uh, that will be interesting to see, Adam. Uh, Assemblywoman, if I could ask you to pivot a little bit and talk about sure. the, uh, the, the whole legislative session now that it's over. Uh, what did the legislature accomplish? What what fell short of the goal line? And uh, what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Um, so I'm going to just speak about the the legislation initiatives that that I was really that I started off the year uh, really wanting to focus on and and, uh, and what my own personal scorecard is, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to personalize it a little bit. Uh, so I had a couple of I had a couple of specific goals um, for this legislative session. Um, the first was I wanted to um, continue to fund uh, an increase in the Medicaid reimbursement rates for nursing homes. Um, our local nursing home, our local not-for-profit nursing homes are really, really struggling. So the Wesley Health Center and um, here in Saratoga Springs and then Fort Hudson in, um, in Fort Edward really financially struggling. And um, and low Medicaid reimbursement rates um, are not helping with this. So um, I'm, I made that a priority in the budget and we made some progress, not nearly what we need to make. We're gonna have to go back next year and continue to fight, um, but we did make some progress with that. The second piece that I really wanted to focus on was um, improving the, the uh, ability of our EMS services to uh, to deliver quality care um, and and really to stabilize emergency services. So as you probably have heard, um, we are seeing a lot of our EMS companies go out of business that they're, you know, particularly in rural communities, they just can't afford to stay in business. And that, as, as you can imagine, is problematic. So um, we had a number of uh, EMS bills that the uh, Upstate Democratic Caucus really prioritized. Um, one of them that we we did get done is what's called treat in place. Um, so this means that uh, if you are living in a rural community and um, uh, and visiting nurses can't get to you, or maybe you uh, maybe you're elderly, you're living at home, um, and you have you you feel your blood pressure spike, or you feel your heart race, or something. You've had a trip and fall, and you need your ankle wrapped. The emergency services, rather than just coming to you, picking you up, and taking you to a hospital, which is a very expensive, expensive thing for you as a patient, expensive for the hospital, expensive for the the EMS, they'll be able to come to the come to you. If it's if it's a question of you know, take your blood pressure, call your primary care physician, find out if you know, do you need a medicate a medical uh, a medicine adjustment, whatever, they'll be able to take care of you there rather than have to only transport you to a hospital. So um, this treat in place model, I think, for particularly our rural communities, is going to be really important. Um, but it also helps the the EMS companies kind of um, be a little more stable in their finances as well, because they're not paying the cost to drive the rig all the way to the hospital and back. So um, that's one thing that we did. Um, the other piece was a, was a continuation of some legislation that I focused on last two sessions ago, which was to allow air ambulances to carry blood and blood products and to start a transfusion um, in the field and on route. So what that means is that, well, prior to that, um, you, if you had, if you were, if you were, a, you know, if you're in a rural community, you have a tractor rollover incident, you've got your, you have, it's a traumatic injury. Maybe you're about to lose a limb because of the, the extent of the injuries. 
the ambulance um, was not able to carry blood and transfuse you, even though that is the standard of care associated with those kinds of um, traumatic physical injuries um, where there's a lot of uh, loss of blood. So we started with the air ambulances um, and they are they have been able to carry blood and blood products and start a transfusion. And I'll just say to you that since we passed that legislation in New York State, um, 200 patients have been transfused en route. They've received 600 transfusions um, and that's 200 lives we've saved. Um, and so now we've expanded it to ground ambulances as well. So you're in a, somebody's in a serious car accident with, a, with severe physical injuries. Now that, that ambulance um, that is gonna transport them to the trauma center down in Albany is going to have blood, um, blood products available to them and they can begin the transfusion right there um, so that the, um, the patient stands the greatest chance of survival. Um, so I'm really proud of this legislation, and it was a it was a real priority for me, and and I, we got that done. And the other side of the ledger, uh, I had a I rural access to dentistry dental care is really uh, really difficult in many parts of the state. Um, we just don't have enough dentists practicing in rural communities um, or upstate communities generally. And so there's long waiting, there's long waiting lists. If you happen to be a Medicaid patient or you are developmentally disabled, um, you, you're talking nine months to over a year uh, to get access to a dentist. And you can, we've all had toothaches. We've all had toothaches. And we know that when you have a toothache, you can't concentrate, you can't go to work, you can't go to school. And, um, or if you do, you're not really concentrating. So access to dental care is a problem. I, I introduced at the beginning of the year a package of nine bills um, to try and deal with this. And we didn't make, we made a small amount of progress, but not, not nearly what we need to make. So I have more work to do to build support for uh, this legislation to, to really help people to understand what the true cost of a lack of dental care is um, and, and why we need to fix this. and 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 to coalesce around um, a set of solutions for um, growing the workforce that work in uh, rural communities providing uh, dental care, particularly for uh, patients who are, are either on Medicaid or who are developmentally disabled. Uh, wow, that, that, that's terrific that you're addressing that issue because uh, um, as you explained, to have, have such a problem with your teeth and you have to wait almost a year is what you're telling me. That's just unacceptable. We, we just can't have that. Right. Excellent. Can I, Adam, do you have anything? And then we could switch. Uh, to, to, uh, we're going to keep you for another minute. Uh, sure. A little lighter here. Tell us about your last weekend. Did you make it to the Belmont? Did you make it to Blues Traveler? Can you, can you tell us your thoughts? No. On it? no, I was in Albany. So I... <laughs> I didn't I didn't leave I didn't leave Albany until 730 Saturday morning. I had I had driven down, I had gotten up at six in the morning on Friday. I had I was in my seat in Albany around 9, 9 15, and I didn't leave until 7:30 the next morning. And uh, so I missed all the fun uh, because when I did get home, you know, like there was, there was no going out. <laughs> so well, it was, just, uh, I missed but, all the fun, but I did watch the race. Hours, huh? I'm sorry, Adam. You're in the chamber for 24 hours. Yeah, basically just about. Wow. Yeah. Oh, oh go ahead, Adam. No, that's, that's, oh. that's, Okay. That's, that's and that's that's typical for the end of session, right? In fact, in fact, that was shorter than some years, right? Uh, yes, you know, we we yes, we did wrap up sooner than we have in some years. But they we were supposed to be done on Thursday. I thought that was great because then I would have Friday and Saturday that I could go to the Belmont. And then they said, "Well, no, we're going to go into Friday." I'm like, "Okay, how far into Friday?" Oh, you know, evening. 
I was, as soon as they said that, I was like, yeah, we're there all night. I, I know how this game, I know this, how this plays out. <clears throat> we'll be there all night and uh, the next morning. So I was grateful that we were done by 730 because there have been, there have been some years where it was like three in the afternoon and uh, that's just, you know, nobody's making good decisions at that point. Yeah. In all fairness, there were some people that left Caroline Street at 730 in the morning and they still made it to the track. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps they're younger than me. <laughs> oh, Assemblyman, thank you for uh, joining us today, especially on the short term rental end of things, but also the, the congratulations on on your personal successes. By the way, folks, uh, I got to point out, if you're writing in comments, I can't see them. We're, we're hobbled when Robin is not here. Uh, she's the tech guru, and she's making sure we're on a, a lot of different platforms. We're, we're operating at about 30% power here today. So if you're writing in an, uh, a, a question, I'm just not seeing them. So I apologize for that. Uh, uh, Slimey Woman, thank you. Will, will you join us again um, uh, later in the you know, year, and maybe over the summer, where you can talk about the time you went to the track and enjoyed yourself and so forth? Absolutely. I am happy to do that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Woman Warner. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Oh, that was that was great. A Adam, we're still having a little bit of sound problems at your end. Uh, uh, it got better, but I think there's still an issue. Really? All right. Is it, yeah. Any better now, Dan? Or? Uh, yeah, it is, actually, at least in this last sentence, sentence. Yes. I was just holding my phone there for the last 20 minutes, so I got to stretch out my forearm a little bit. Oh, uh, okay. Anyway, oh, yeah. but so Dan, real real quick, let's let's talk about the Belmont a little more. So you know, we talked about Blues Traveler and that Thursday night concert Saturday. Let's let's, let's jump right into the Belmont. Uh, Fifty thousand people there. Uh, you, you know, you Saratoga Report did a great report about it. You copy. You had some slight critiques. The bathroom lines were long. Do you want to go over a couple of the small critiques you had? Yeah, but I I I, I, I want to start off by not glossing over the good, right? I mean, a lot of things could have gone wrong, both both somewhat in their control and out of their control. You know, we could have had sideways rain all weekend. In fact, the, the weather forecast was calling for a lot more rain that appeared. The day itself, Saturday, what's yeah. that? What's that? I said we dodged a bullet because that whole week. Yes. The whole yes. And, and, we, and, we, and we certainly had some rain, uh, notably Friday and Sunday, but not Saturday, and that was the big day. It was, In fact, the weather – you could go to the track for a hundred years and you would not get better weather than you did on Saturday. Right. It was like 73 degrees, that bright sun, there was some sun, but not, it wasn't beating down on you all day. Um, it was just so comfortable. You, you could wear a, you could wear a three piece suit there and, and not sweat like you often find yourself doing in August. Um, and, and there were some people dressed to the nines, of course it's, it's, it's horse racing. It's the Belmont. Uh, so, so good for them. So that was terrific. The racing was terrific. You know, how, how do I say this subtly? I can't. So I'm just going to say, uh, as far as I know, there weren't any horse breakdowns. Uh, there, there weren't any major injuries to jockeys or horses. Um, certainly the, the over the weekend in the city and at the track, I'm sure there were some arrests made, but nothing of note, nothing nothing horrible that I that I saw. Um, so there was so much good that I, that I, uh, I, I barely even want to go into my quibbles, and they are quibbles. Um, cause I, you know, cause I, I will, I'm going to jump, a, uh, I'm going to put my cheer into this here. Um, the city leaders, both government and, and business leaders, the business owners, the chamber, discover Saratoga, the months and months of planning that went into this between the blues traveler concert and everything else. And then at Naira and the, the security for the police department, the fire department, uh, the other agencies that are involved. And it's not just the, the, the first responders, Really, the whole city, the, the, the entire city of uh, employees and elected officials and so forth, I, I can't give enough praise. Do you want to comment, Adam? Yeah, I, I, get, I just want to echo that. The, uh, Todd Shinkitz and the Chamber of Commerce did a fantastic job. Uh, Daryl Legit, I believe is his last name, and Discover Saratoga did a fantastic job. Uh, Tim Cole, the, the Commissioner of Public Safety, and his police and firemen did a great job. Uh, and, it, and it was all around. Everybody stepped up. Any of the little quibbles were were not even really in Saratoga's control, right? The, the, right. the back, mostly Naira State things that that are. And, and you mentioned this in the Saratoga report. Things that are easily easily fixable, right? The bathroom lines are too long. Get some porta potties. Yeah. I heard the ATM yes. 
money. Get get a couple more ATMs next year, but things that can be can be fixed and fixed fairly easily. Uh, yes, you're right. And I'm sure Naira knows this because if they didn't know this, uh, they did when social media got a hold of these issues, especially the bathrooms. Let me uh, hang on. I got my report here. Let me list a couple of the other. And they're quibbles, folks. Uh, like you said, Adam, easily fixable. Um, $17 for 22 ounces of beer, and that's your only option? I, uh, yeah, that, that was a problem. And, and apparently you could buy four beers, but I was there alone, right? And I, I just need a 12 or 16 ounce thing of beer. If you're not going to let me bring my own alcohol in, fine. You know, you're a sporting event. I get it. Uh, the, the, the other sport, sports uh, uh, leagues and so forth don't allow you to do that. But give me a few options. Don't force me to drink 22, 24 ounces of beer that half of it's going to be warm by the time I get to it. I'm a lightweight these days. I, I cannot chug like I did back in my 20s. Yeah, I was going to say, then when you got to give it back, you got to wait in line 15 minutes, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, a long time in some cases. I, I was shocked, shocked by how long the lines were. There were some complaints on social media of the design of the new Jim Dandy bathrooms. They basically did a flip-flop. The old Jim Dandy bar on the inside, which was hard to see if you weren't familiar with the track, is now the men's and ladies' room. And then the new Jim Dandy bars where the men's and ladies' room used to be. So you, you almost can't get past that area without seeing the bar. It's very, it, it protrudes out. It's very uh, uh, obvious that it's there. Um, and that's good. It's good for business, right? Good for Naira for realizing that and addressing it. But the bathrooms, there were some complaints of the design. Apparently, there's a bit of a bottleneck getting in the men's and ladies' room. The ladies apparently have to get past the men's line to get to the ladies' room, whereas the old men's and women's room had each had uh, separate entrances and exits, in other words, four points, I believe now is what I understand is really only two points sharing the same hallway, if you will, or the same uh, entranceway, if you will. So, that, you know, again, I don't know how easily that's fixable. And that's only on the busiest of days. So maybe we'll just have to live with it. Um, uh, I, I complained with when I was on with Robin last week about Ticketmaster uh, gouging, essentially, is my view. I, I think they gouge customers and they get away with it and they give tremendous profits. And just last week, uh, I think Robert Millers was the first one, our friend Robert, uh, Bob, was, was the first one to note that uh, Ticketmaster and Live Nation were being sued by the federal government for antitrust actions and alleged antitrust act, actions and so forth. So good, good. Um, I don't know how if I had much faith. Sometimes these companies just work it into their business plan, cost of doing business. Uh, but I'm hoping they get hit hard, and I'm hoping this gets addressed. <laughs> Here, I, I remember growing up with SPAC, and it was just simple. You'd go in there, you'd pay 15 bucks, 20 bucks for the lawn, more for the inside. You know, now even for SPAC, because of Live Nation, there's dynamic pricing and overselling and just just a, a, a corporate money grab, it feels like. And it's really, it's really a, a detriment to some of these really unique boutique venues like the track or the Performing Arts Center that Saratoga has to have it feel like you're being nickel and dime and and, and, and worse than that, really squeeze. Yes, worse than that, yes. Yeah, it's not even nickel and dime. It's in squeeze for, for everything they can get out of you to, to go to these these events that should really be more about about the the fan and the the sport or the, the concert than the than the corporate greed. So I, I agree. That's a problem. I hope the federal government really addresses it. Excellent. Yeah. And um, um, God, I had one more thing I had to say. Um, I guess it, I, I didn't. I, I, I'm ready to pivot on another issue if, if you got a minute. I bet you you might have something to say about this. Go ahead. Oh, okay, listen, I, I was on South Broadway and I posted on your Facebook page what's going on in Saratoga. I think it was yesterday or the day before, Adam, of the crazy amount of construction going on at the old uh, Murphy's Golf Driving Range, which is now the new, new what will be the new Treehouse Brewing uh, location in Saratoga. And and uh, what I commented was the, that place, has, a lot of Saratogians have been to the ones, and there are three of them in Massachusetts and one in Connecticut, I believe. And the, they just these people just beam. They love the place. They love the beer. They love the concept. Have you been to one, Adam? No, but I get the same feedback you do. Of, of it's, it, I, I can't wait to go because the experience, and, and, and like you said, the people are glowing and beaming when they're talking about this treehouse brewing company. And I don't know exactly, I guess there's games or some backyard activities that you would have in your backyard, but I can't imagine what makes it so special, but literally to a person, it seems like it's going to be a special place. And you did, you commented, there are ways in no time throwing that up. I can't wait. 
Yeah, t- take a ride past it, folks. You'd just be amazed. Uh, it looks like a mini Hoover Dam going up with the amount of – I mean, I'm overstating it, of course, a little hyperbole, but but it's just impressive the amount of construction going on there. Um, and, uh, Adam, you know, I looked it up before we got on. The Treehouse Brewing in Deerfield, Massachusetts, is uh, just north of Springfield. It's 140 miles away from the spa city here, two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, I'm thinking road trip. <laughs> a, what, what do you think? Get one two minutes away. You want to go? Yeah. Uh, I I I want to I want to scope this out. I want to do a a a recon mission to yeah, see so see what this place is all about. Yeah. Hey, Treehouse Treehouse Brewing. If if you're listening to this, set up set up a little stage for us. We'll come and drink some beer and critique it. <laughs> exactly. I am going to reach out to the company. I'd I'd like to do that. So somebody in the media probably will soon. I mean, it's it's just I, I don't think we're overstating it. It just has a. A tremendous, tremendous following. Apparently, some of them are mini concert venues as well. They have the outdoor activities you talked about, Adam, and they usually attach themselves to trails and state parks, much like this one will be. So uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, I can't fully explain it yet because I haven't been to one yet, but a lot of Saratogians have. I wish we could have comments here. Uh, 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 my friend Bruce Cleon, Cleon uh, commented. And he said he said to somebody who was like sort of poo pooing it. Saying you don't understand the economic impact were his words. I was like, oh my God, he can it's the effect, the economic impact it's gonna have on Saratoga of this place. Like, wow, those are strong words. Bruce, if you're listening, I should have called you. We're supposed to get coffee later this week anyway. Um, so anyway, Adam, that, that that's what I had on that. Do you have any other issues? Uh we can maybe uh, go into uh, cheers and jeers uh, shortly if, if you don't. Oh, the cheers and jeers. Okay, and Robin has a uh, fancy Cheers and Jeers banner. I don't, uh, so we're going to go banner-free. Sounds banner here on the Cheers and Jeers. I, I said my cheer was to you know, every city employee and, and all the businesses and the business organizations, as you mentioned, Adam, the chamber, the Discover Saratoga, Daryl Lajiri, uh, Todd Shimkus, and all the people and all the business owners. Uh, Naira, let me give a cheer to Naira. I, I gave them a couple you know, uh, a quibbles, but overall, they crushed it. Uh, I got a jeer that has nothing to do with, well, it's related to the Belmont, but but not, it's more about horse racing in general. Uh, trainer, a well-known trainer, Steve Asmussen, um, just got uh, hit by the, the federal government for, uh, uh, you know, essentially some wage violations to the tune of, I think, $450,000. And this is not the first time he's been hit with this. And on this current thing, I don't know. Maybe he's going to appeal it. Maybe it was just alleged at this point. So I'm not going to directly criticize him for this, but he has priors. Okay. And here's my point. New York state is supposedly a, supposedly a a labor friendly state. So why do trainers or anybody for that matter, that, that has multiple, you know, wage violations, which is wage theft. You're not paying them proper overtime and, and other, other proper payments. That's wage theft. Why are they allowed to continue to have a trainer's license in this state? How, how, how is that possible? That's my that's my jeer to the state of New York. We can probably change that via a rule change. First of all, it might be in the rules. I've not read up on it. There could be a catch-all, uh, you know, the bad conduct catch-all. I don't know if there if there if there, but if there isn't, they should address this. If you're committing wage violations against you know low-income earners, some that don't even speak the language and don't know their rights. Uh, that that should be a huge problem. Saratoga should stand strong and proud uh, along with these workers that live in our community. And not and that would be a real penalty, not a few hundred thousand dollar fine that they work into their budget. Uh, your thoughts on that, Adam? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, it is. It, it is um, unfortunate, like you said, when when employers use their power to suppress you know, employees who especially who are coming from, uh, you know, a, a, a disadvantaged position like a, a, a somebody who was not born in the States or is not a fluent English speaker and doesn't fully understand their rights. And for them to leverage that, that their power is is unfortunate. And I agree with you. It should be it should be dealt with pretty harshly. Uh, so let's let's hope that and let's hope that and like you said, New York State. Now, I have a lot of problem with New York State labor laws, too. I think they overstretch, but the, but that's that's separate. Once the law is the law, you still got to abide by the law. You know, you can have right. problems. You to not do it. So certainly, I, I have issues with New York State labor law, but but I also have issues with people who once that law is law, break that law. So I agree, Dan. Uh, excellent. So that, that that's that's all I have uh, for for my end, Adam. What, what do you got? 
So my my cheer, same thing. The city of Saratoga, the employees, everybody who made this happen. It just was an incredible weekend that could not have really gone smoother. You know, there was a couple little hiccups, but that's to be expected. Way to go, Saratoga. Kind of a national cheer. It's something we had talked about before on the show, but the the U.S. Women's Olympic team leaving Caitlin Clark off. It's just you you know the sport is just killing itself. They. They talked about, you know, they showed Caitlin Clark's salary for her first year playing was seventy thousand dollars. This was, this is not a lot of money, but this is capitalism. This is what that league can can afford. I understand, you know, she is arguably one of the twelve best players in the league. You can clearly make that argument, but she will bring eyes to on a national stage to the sport that's desperately trying to grow its fan base. Leaving her off now, I mean, I honestly, I, I could. Not really care less now about this the, the women's basketball in the Olympics. I hope USA wins. But if she was watching, if she was playing, I'd be watching all those games because she is an exciting player. The way she just pulls up and nails those threes from you know, this, seeming the eternity away, she is is a great uh, attraction, a great talent. She beat the boys in, in viewership this year, and for 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 women's basketball to leave her off again, you're not putting her on is not giving her charity. She you could easily make the argument she should be. She, is, she deserves to be on that team, so poo-poo to you. Anyway, Dan, I think that was, that's that's everything I got. It was a great show. Uh, right. Next, talking about the city council meeting again, so tune back in. Yeah, the city council will be meeting uh, the, the, this uh, Tuesday, less than a week away, correct? Six days out, would that be the 18th? Right, that's right. So we'll, we'll be on next week to talk about it. Okay, Adam. Th- uh, th- thanks. We uh, thanks for uh, being my my uh, co-host today, and we we got it, we got it done. Um, and we're looking right now. There's 38 people watching this live. We're gonna post it on our usual channels. It won't be live on our usual channels, but uh, at least some got to watch it live. And then so it'll be available for review. And this is better than anything on Netflix, folks. Right? Right, Adam. <laughs> Absolutely right. All right. Nice seeing you, Dan. Stay charming, Thanks, thanks for watching, folks.